Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Urban Update. I'm Byron Barnett. Well, it was official on January 20th. President-elect Barack Obama became President Barack Obama. And now questions for the next four years will be dealt with on multiple levels. Questions from the nation about how to fix the ailing economy. Questions from other nations about restoring America's role as leader of the world. Questions from millions of black Americans asking what is the new president going to do for them. And questions about whether a black man is capable of leading. This morning, those in other questions will be asked of my guests. Joining me this morning is Richard Taylor, who is chairman of the Taylor Smith Properties Development Firm and former Transportation Secretary in the Build Weld Administration. Horace Small, he's the Executive Director of the Union of Minority Neighborhoods, and he's been in community organizing for 30 years. And Darnell Williams is President of the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts. Thank you all for coming in today, and welcome to Urban Update. Hey, all right, gentlemen. Hey, well, it's a, it's a new day in America. I guess first thing I'd like to throw out is why now, why at this time do you think America has turned to a black man uh, to lead the country and, and lead the world? I don't know who wants to try to take a crack at that one first. Richard? Well, I don't know that uh, the total definition of Barack Obama is a black man. I think he was smart enough and strategic enough to understand that the campaign mantra when he ran was change and not so much experience. His use of the internet uh, galvanized tremendous numbers of volunteers and people to contribute to his campaign. He happened to be African American. I think he took some risk. Uh, he's very smart, a great team, and uh, the country saw all of his talent. H H Horace, what do you think? Certainly we're dealing with one of the most brilliant men of our time. Um, the fact that he can overcome um, the idea that people saw him as an African-American, the fact that he could compete competitively and could build together, as, as Robert said, a, an incredible campaign apparatus that had the ability to speak to and touch the lives of so many folks. And I think the other thing, too, is that, that, that one of the great things about being a community organizer is that community organizers are master manipulators. So you have to get people, you have to get, you have to get people into a place to get them to do what, the, what, what you need them to do. And he was able, because of that, I think, he was able to speak to folks in the language that they understood. He could talk to automakers in the language that they understood. He could talk to the unemployed in the language that they understood. He could talk to college students in the language that they understood. And, 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 and that, I, in my view, galvanized folks into saying, like, this is a leader, this is a man that can take us to another level. But, but Darnell Williams, you know, still, I mean, 200 years <coughs> history of, uh, of uh, middle-aged to older white male presidents. So, uh, this is a radical turn. Why do you think America made such a radical turn at this particular time in history? Well, I would probably pull a page out of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's book that people are judging a person not by the color of their skin, but by the, the content of the character. And if you look at how Senator, Senator uh, President Obama really ran the campaign where he really, really be showed a very steady hand. He represented a presence that could be occupied in the White House that would resonate around the world. And with someone who has surrounded himself with, I think, some very talented people that will really be able to wrestle with the problems. And so we're very excited about his presidency. But we also recognize that America has really come to terms with recognizing that, that we have an opportunity to do something great here. And he was at the right person at the right time mm -hmm. to, fill, exactly to fill that exactly. slot. That's exactly right. I mean, Byron, the thing that, 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 that you know, Darnell is absolutely right on, I think there, there was a perfect storm as well. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and I come from Pennsylvania. And in places like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, West Virginia, I mean, in those areas where, where industry has been the lifeline of, uh, of the economy of the states, you know, long-term unemployment that's been exacerbated by Republican administrations for close to 30 years really gave, you know, it got to the point now, do you want more of the same or do you want to try something else? And I think white folks, particularly those white folks in Western Pennsylvania who hate black people for sport, you know, had to, had to go past themselves and say, 
I got to I got to try this. Exactly because you know mm-hmm. we've we've tried the alternative and it just doesn't work. Uh, you know you bring up that point about uh, the white folks and maybe maybe not too fond of black people. I believe I saw an article at once that said the, t- the headline was racist for Obama. Yeah. It was on one of those websites. <laughs> they said people who admittedly did not like black people, but you know things were so bad. You know they had they had to cast a vote for exactly. Barack Obama. Exactly. But uh, what about expect? What does that mean? Say for expectations. Do you think? Um, look how high uh, expectations are for him. Would you agree they are very, very high? They are very, very high. But at the same time, uh, I think if you look at prior to his swearing in, he's put an exemplary cabinet together. He's brought a broad range of very, very talented people, some very, very experienced, which was important, and others who are new but very, very capable. So I think people are feeling very good about his team. I also think that he has said himself in his speech in Grant Park, this is so complicated, it might not take a year, and in fact, it might take more than four years. So he's helping us to manage our expectations, but boy, his plate is very full. Okay, we're gonna take a little break light right there, and what is the black community expecting from America's first African-American president? A reality check when we return, stay with us. Although black Americans are rejoicing over President Obama's success, there are many who are asking, what is he going to do for the urban communities of color and how soon? Uh, back here with our panel, uh, what, d- does black America expect President Obama to be a, uh, the, a panacea for black people, for all the um, injustices perpetrated against him over, over the centuries? What do you think? Uh, well, I would or? think, uh, you know, <laughs> You know, I, I, I think in I think in, 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 in you know in our fantasies that like we like to think that that, that Barack Obama's gonna put chicken and chitlins in every pot. But it's a fantasy. I mean, as we've learned from the experience with Deval Patrick uh, becoming the first black governor of Massachusetts, it's a lot harder than people think it is. Um, the first thing, I mean, the first nine months, I mean, the Barack Obama has to learn where the executive bathroom is. I mean, you know, there's a whole process of learning on the job that he has to do, and he doesn't really have that much time. He's got, he's got, he's got international incidents going on all over the place. He's got two wars. He has an economy in the tank. And, you know, I do think, you know, and he made it very clear from, as you said before, when we were off uh, camera for a little bit, you know, about from dreams of his fa- dreams of our fa- my father, his thought process evolves and he understands what it is that he has to do. He certainly recognizes that, that, um, that Congress, that, that he has all these different minefields to walk. In time, he's going to have an agenda. His economic stimulus package is certainly something that's going to affect communities of color. But again, that's a process, as, as Darnell and I and Richard know, know all too well, that, that the legislative process is slow and unseemly, and that there's a difference between a, you know, a Alabama Democrat and a, and, a, and, a, and a Minnesota Democrat. So it's going to take time, but it's going to get there. Now, go ahead. I just want to say one other thing. I think the most important thing for the African American community with respect to the 44th president is he lifted the spirit yeah. of many people. Yeah. Nobody's going to quit their day job, but you can straighten your back just a little tighter and stiffer. You can feel that your children and your grandchildren can achieve anything, and people who see you today view you differently. And I think that's the most important thing uh, that uh, Barack Obama did becoming president. Now, a lot of people believe that, uh, uh, or say that Barack Obama, as you point out, um, uh, has really set the standard of achievement, you know, raise the bar f- for black people. Uh, uh, what do you think? Does that mean that uh, being a person of color is no longer an excuse for uh, uh, not achieving, um, you know, heights? I mean, does it mean the end of affirmative action? Well, I don't think it was ever a uh, reason to say that you shouldn't be striving to achieve. I think that's a false misnomer from my perspective. I think it's always been that we want you to go out to be better than than anybody else in doing to doing the job. Affirmative action was a instrument, a tool, given the ins, uh, the circumstances that we were dealt with. Now going forward, now I think that it really does do, what it does do. It helps individuals to recognize I'm not going to let any hurdles stand in my way. If I set a goal and objective in mind, then I can achieve it. But in managing expectations in terms of black, I would say this in terms of your earlier question. 
that Barack Obama was not only elected by black people, he was mm -hmm. elected by gays and, and lesbians, and, and he was elected by whites and Latinos mm -hmm. across the country. So clearly, the, the, the black community cannot expect that he's going to do something significantly more for them. He has an, inherited an America that is in pain, that's it broke, doesn't have any money, they lost their jobs. So he's given us inspiration and hope. And so in that managing expectation, Without being, we have to recognize just really quickly, when when Nelson Mandela was was elected president in South Africa, they thought all the shanty towns are going to be uh, torn down, torn down and replaced yeah. three weeks later. Now we're yeah. into our third president in South Africa, and they still got the shanty town. So we have to be realistic in our insights. Well, what, what about the the psyche with this? Um, I'm going to stay on this for a little bit longer. What about the psyche uh, of black people? Uh, people, you know, middle-aged and uh, older black Americans uh, in this country, if you're if an adult in this country, but now, suddenly, just the day after the election, you know, it's it's like a, a light switch is going on. Uh, they voted for a black guy for president. But look, what, what does that do for the psyche? What it does, though, is you have to be clear. Barack Obama is exhibit A for opportunity meeting preparation with risk. If that first caucus or primary had been in South Carolina and not Iowa, I don't believe he would be president. The black community didn't support Barack Obama when he started. Only after a strong finish in Iowa, a close second in New Hampshire, did South Carolina come around. So you have to take some risk here. No one, is, no one gave him anything. If you beat the Clinton machine, and he beat the Clinton machine, he ran a 21st century campaign, they ran a 20th century campaign. Opportunity, preparation, and risk. And, and, and on that note, Byron, I think it, it's critical that, that the one thing that Barack's campaign did was, it, 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 as Edward said, we all walked a little prouder, we all walked a little straighter. And it, and it speaks to the fact that, that we do have the skills and the abilities to articulate our own agenda. And, and, and one of the things that stands out so glaringly, particularly in, in black Massachusetts, is that you know, if you were to talk to different black constituency groups, there would be different agendas for different days. And and in order for our electeds to become effective, you know, it, it seems that we're going, the opportunity has now presented itself that we could come together, organize, and be able to say with some clarity to to our electeds in, in the state house in particular, this is what the black community wants, this is what we need, and we've proven that with the election of Barack Obama that we actually do have the savvy to go about the business of trying to push this agenda. The challenge is ours. It goes, in, what's that risk, what? You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. We're going to take another quick little break here. Not since Franklin Roosevelt uh, has uh, America seen such a critical domestic crisis. And many are wondering, is our new leader, Barack Obama, up to the task of fixing America? We'll explore that when we return. Well, with the Wall Street debacle, the auto industry looking for a bailout, home foreclosures, and energy as a national security issue, how can President Obama rebuild the American dream? Well, he's, uh, he's got his work cut out for him, doesn't he, Darnell? Don't you think this, I guess, focusing on the economy, Economy. This is really going to be his uh, his first major test, wouldn't you say? Oh, clearly. I think that if we look what uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt stated, that the only thing that we have is fear and fear itself. I think fear has gripped America, has, has gripped the economy. And I think that uh, President Obama and his administration are focusing on green technology, five million new jobs over the next 10 years building the bridges, the infrastructure, schools, construction dollars. The challenge is that they're going to get a lot of money into the hands of the state governments and there's going to be a short window to spend that money. So the question is that we have to have the apparatus and the mechanism in order to make sure that that money reach the people. Because obviously we don't want it to reach to the state governments and it gets bogged down into the political uh, normal process. So if there's a way to jumpstart the economy and get the infrastructure in terms of roads, bridges, mm -hmm. schools, and, and green technology jobs, I think that's going to be a huge uh, boost for us. But uh, in, in doing that, uh, and taking action, I mean, does he uh, run the risk of uh, looking like just another tax and spend liberal? No, not really. I, I think the key is that we know that it's going to cost money to get out of this. So we have to take money. And instead of putting money into the hands of the banks and the financiers, we need to put money into the hands of consumers so they can reduce their credit card debt, 
make sure they don't go into foreclosure. And because of the manufacturing jobs, the auto industry impact, we need to find another way to reduce our dependency on fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. And the clean energy jobs or the eco-friendly jobs is a way to do that. Uh, Richard Taylor, uh, you're, you've been in a Republican administration. That's what do you correct. think about that? Do you think this, uh, he runs the risk of looking like just another tax and spend liberal if he takes on these, these huge amounts of money trying to jumpstart the economy? No, I don't. I think that the nation recognizes now that for all intents and purposes, the government is the economy. And in prior years, we were in a hands-off, anti-regulatory environment, which got us into some difficulty, particularly down on Wall Street. And so you're going to see government, and I think under uh, Barack Obama, with a very strong and seasoned economic team, really take an appropriate role for the government to play uh, in the economy. I think the stimulus is critical. People are not only are waiting for it and are thirsting for it. So I think his first push will be well received. Do you think uh, it's time, do you think America is ready for quote unquote bold action? And do you think, the, the, do you, oh, do you think I, I, Barack I, I, Obama I, needs to do something big? Absolutely, I mean, the, 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 the government, when under Bush's presidency, we didn't think that Wall Street liked socialism until they actually got in trouble. Then they really became, fell in love with socialism. Right. It becomes clear that that government becomes the last resort when people are desperately in need. And I think I think Barack Obama recognizes that all of us are desperately in need. That that, that states and cities have suffered for a very very long time under close to 30 years of Republican rule, and that the economy that, that where the United States goes, that's where the world's going to go. So he has to he has to, in order to spend money, in order to make money, you gotta spend some money. And so that's what he has to do with this economic stimulus plan. And and the thing that I like about what he's doing is the fact that he's actually studied and prepared for this. I mean he has read every book on on Roosevelt, every book on on he has sat down with Doris Kern Goodwin and all the various historians to get a historical perspective of the thirties, of the depression in those days. So that which has helped guide him and his thinking in terms of what to do to jumpstart the economy, because that's what has to happen in order for this country to survive. One of the uh, priorities he said he was going to uh, deal with, um, one of his top priorities, he said, obviously he's going to deal with the economic situation, because that's a crisis that's yes. laying right in his lap. But uh, one of his top priorities, he said, will be energy policy. What do you, th what do you make of that decision and putting that on such a high, uh, as such a high priority? He says it's number, it's number one priority. Well, he's recognized two things. We need a new industry for job creation, number one. And at the same time, we need to reduce our dependency on foreign oil. Uh, now, that's going to be juxtaposed with this auto industry crisis as well. So the hope is that there's a combination of funds that will go to the auto industry that will help them come up with a new strategic plan, while at the same time, reigniting this industry, as Donnell mentioned a few minutes ago. Now, you talk about energy policy, you're talking about fixing the economy and health care, because are, all, are we seeing a situation where all of these things are coming together and have to be dealt with at once? Because obviously, Detroit's not going to be settled until this health care thing is settled. The, uh, the whole energy thing is not going to be settled, the, the car industry, until we figure out how to make some cars that Americans are going to want to buy. Well, I, I would think that, that you're going to be dealing with multiple um, components of this problem. That's why it's so complex. But if I just go back to your energy, not only in addition to the, the, the reducing the dependency on the fossil fuel, we have to find ways how do we harness solar energy? How do we incorporate the, the wind technology to reduce our dependency upon that fossil fuel? <coughs> Those are jobs that can be created around solar panels, whether it's in the commercial or as well as residential areas. So when we look at um, how, do, how that can be done on a national scale, can benefit us in terms of the grids that need to transfer electricity to areas they can use the solar as well as the wind in order to do that. So I think that those are the kinds of things. But there's going to be multiple buckets that are going to be before them. Okay, we're going to take another little break here. The whole world was watching as Barack Obama became the most powerful man in the world. Now many of America's allies and foes want to know, can America regain its position as a stabilizing force in the global community? More analysis on the new president after this break. Stay with us. 
There were celebrations across the globe when President Obama became leader of the free world. But with the power comes responsibility and the rest of the world is waiting to see how he handles the various world crises. The question is, can President Obama, as he suggested during the campaign, change the world? Uh, now that was one of the signature lines during his campaign, together we can change the world. What do you think, what impact do you think that uh, Barack Obama can or will have on um, you know, the world affairs? Um, well, well, first of all, if you look at when he went to Berlin, there were 200,000 people there and he was a mere candidate. There will be two million there when he returns uh, as president. But I think you have to look at a couple of things. Number one, he has uh, international roots. <coughs> he has an international name. And he understands the world from his father's perspective and from his own travels. He is also a conciliatory person. He listens. So the world views him just when you watch him as someone that will be engaging. So I think that there are appropriate high expectations among international leaders in all continents, and I think he'll be very well received. What do you think about his, uh, what does it do for the image of the United States just to have uh, someone who looks like him standing up as uh, being the leader of the most powerful nation on the planet? Well, the world loves him because he was the first candidate to repudiate the Bush Doctrine. I mean, and, and, and that, you know, living, recognizing that we live in a, live in a, a very small place, um, was huge, as, as Richard said, with the crowds that he would get and, and his worldview. I mean, and, and it's already had some, some effect in places like, for instance, the Aborigines in Australia, who've now started to come together and begun organizing for political power in their country, and they didn't end essentially slavery till 1974. Or in Brazil, where, you know, where, where 50 percent of, of, of the population of Brazil is, is darker folks like ourselves, and they've begun to start working to get to, to start demanding their place, um, you know, their respect and their power and their politics uh, with uh, President Lula da Silva. So there's, it's just the fact that he got elected sent a, a major, major uh, message to, to, to minority communities around the world. But also with the people like Sarkozy and others yeah. who believe very strongly that, that you can't operate in a worldview that the United States runs everything and everybody else is supposed to kowtow to it. Uh, Barack was the first to, to, to repudiate that. And that's why he was embraced as, as, as much as he was. Now, now what do you think about uh, the, the image of the United States being led by a black man? What the, how does the rest of the world react to that? Does that is it a a factor at all doesn't mean anything. I think it's it's a huge tsunami of a factor that you have a black man and 219 years of of predominantly white male presidents. Uh, we have a black person of biracial descent that's sitting there in a the seat. So the image in and of itself sends a tsunami message that America has changed or has an opportunity to not only interface with who our friends as well as our potential enemies are, that he's made that a part of a, his hallmark, that I will listen to them. Now, he's changed the, the posture in terms of sitting down with unconditions or any conditions. I think that we have an opportunity here to restore what has been destroyed, the 50 years of diplomacy, uh, the challenges in Korea within Israel and Palestine, if we look at what's going on in South America, Central America, we have some real major pockets of opportunities. What should we do about our relationship with Cuba? And so I believe that this administration, Obama administration, has a wonderful opportunity, not because he is black, but because he's black, he knows how to surround himself with the right people to get the job done. That's my opinion. Well, look, now he's talking about uh, surrounding the people he's surrounding himself with. Um, Robert Gates, uh, Bush defense secretary, yes. Hillary Clinton, obviously <coughs> part of the Clinton. Now, a lot of people, a critic might say, well, gosh, that doesn't seem like change. That seems like you know more of the same. Uh, do you think that's a disappointment to progressives? That, uh, well, look, the, the, the issue is he is no longer a candidate. He is the president, and he walks into the presidency with certain circumstances. When you have war, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, because he cannot be accused of having a problem with a new defense secretary. And I think that that was critical. Secretary of State Clinton, on the other hand, was not necessarily a choice that he had to make, but he did make it. And I think people, the, both the, the people of the, the country and the Senate are comfortable with her world skills. Very quickly uh, now, do, you th do progressives have anything uh, to worry about? Uh, is he 
Uh, is Barack Obama not a progressive? Is he, or is he just really Barack, a practical person? Barack Obama is a practical progressive. <laughs> and, there, and there is absolutely, and, 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 that, and that speaks to the three of us at this table. I mean, you know, we know how we want the world to be, but we have to operate by, by the parameters that are already set. What he's clear about is that he is the boss. They have to do what he wants them to do, and I, I can I can just assure you, by he's the first president I ever knew that I used to go to bed and I'd say, "God bless my president." Okay, we'll see. Uh, he's <laughs> off. To, uh, he's All off right. to a start, and we'll see what happens in the next four years. Uh, Horace Small, Darnell Williams, Richard Taylor, gentlemen, thanks for all for coming in today. Well, that's it for this edition of uh, Urban Update. If you'd like more information about our program, you can go to our website at whdh.com and click on Urban Update. I'd like to thank my guests for their participation. As always, thank you for watching. Until next week, I'm Byron Barnett for Urban Update. Have a great Sunday, everyone.